I'm going to be talking about WebSockets. Uh, and so WebSockets is a protocol that's mostly used for between uh, web browsers, JavaScript and web browsers and the server. And so it's a two-way connection. And it's a protocol for talking over that connection. Uh, and so in this talk, I'm going to mostly be talking about, uh, well, OK, there. So I'm mostly going to be talking about uh, sort of the cool parts of the protocol, sort of in the sense of like if you're designing a protocol, what do you need to think about? Uh, and so I'm going to try to highlight those while also giving you sort of the context of WebSockets and telling you the whole protocol so that you can see the interesting parts in uh, context. So why did they ma why did they design WebSockets? Um, so it's mainly to support sort of re real time collaboration tools. So like Google Docs is an example of those. Uh, also games where you're sort of collaborating in the same world and editing the same world. And so the, the stuff you need to be able to do that is you want to be able to edit on your screen. And by the time you looked at over at your friend to tell them that you've made an edit, you can also see it on their screen. Um, and so that means you have to get it to the server, and then the server has to push it to your friend's computer uh, for that to work. Um, and that means that you need you know, some, some standard to talk from the browser to the server, because JavaScript can only do things that the browser implements for it. Um, and that means you need a standard so that you can implement it in all of the browsers instead of just one, because nobody's going to use it if it's only in one browser. And so this has to be, it has to be two-way push, so it's also called full duplex. So either side has to be able to send data, because you never know when, who's going to make the next edit, so you don't know which end wants to push. Um, and it needs to be lower latency than making an HTTP request, because it's actually kind of slow. You have to do a whole round trip to set up a TCP connection, and then you can send your HTTP request to push data from the browser. And that's like a whole extra round trip that you don't really need in order to get the data across. Um, existing solutions for letting the server push data to the client are like long polling, which means you send an HTTP request, but the server knows they can just sort of hang out and wait for it wait for it to actually have data. So that's not actually as bad, because they can already push data immediately. Um, but so we want lower latency to actually push data from the client to the server, which means basically avoiding starting a new connection. And so WebSockets is a solution to this problem. Um, and so it's based in a TCP socket. So it's a persistent connection. You open the WebSocket, and then the whole time the WebSocket is open, the TCP socket underneath is also open. Um, and it's a message-based protocol. Uh, so the, the web browser implements the client half of this protocol. You could also implement it on another server, but it's not used as much for server-to-server -server communication since it's not, so it's not like specially designed for that. Um, so it's a message-based protocol, um, which means that the application on the server will sends like blobs of data to the application in the browser uh, and back and forth. Um, and so First, we're going to through, we're gonna through, go through the sort of life of a WebSocket, so you have you know, a framework to think about the rest of the talk in. Um, and so the, you open the WebSocket by doing an opening handshake. And so in this handshake, you have to agree on what versions of WebSockets you're using, that you're going to speak WebSockets, any sub-protocols you're going to use. And then once you've done that, you can start exchanging messages. Um, and so the data messages from the application can either be UTF-8 text, or they can be binary blobs. And then there's also control messages, which we'll talk. There's specific kinds of control messages that are not uh, sending application data, and so we'll talk about those later. And then at the end of your uh, connection, you do a closing handshake, and this is this is some, some control messages. Um, this is not just closing the TCP socket. Uh, you could just close the TCP socket, but the closing handshake means that the other side will know that you got all of the data you were trying to send it. Um, and so first, let's go back to the opening handshake. And so the opening handshake is all about negotiation. Um, and so the handshake is uh, HTTP request and response. So the, the client opens a TCP socket to the server, and then it sends this request. And then the server sends back this response. This is the sort of successful handshake. We'll talk a little bit about how handshakes can fail in a minute. Um, so the client is sending a GET request. The server is responding with uh, 101 switching protocols. This is something already built into HTTP, although I'm not aware of anything else other than WebSockets that uses it. So there's already like a thing built into HTTP to say, let's reuse this socket to speak something other than HTTP. Uh, in particular, the client is asking to upgrade to WebSockets. This is like the headers you're supposed to put in if you want to switch protocols. 
And so it specifically says it wants to change to WebSockets. I mean, upgrade is just say you want to switch protocols. It doesn't necessarily say that WebSockets are better than HTTP or anything. The uh, server uh, replies with the same headers, saying it understands that we're switching to WebSockets. Um, there's these two headers that look a little more complicated. There, there's these blobs of base64 encoded numbers. Um, we're going to talk more in a minute about how exactly you get one from the other, but the important part of this is that the server's uh, sec websocket accept header is based on the client's uh, sec websocket key. Uh, then you, they also do th the actual negotiation part is you know negotiate what sub protocol you want to use. So the client is offering to do chat or super chat, and the server is saying let's use chat. This is like a sub protocol that defines what the payload is supposed to look like in more detail than just any binary blob you want. And then the client is saying let's do version 13 of WebSockets, and the server is agreeing to that by by replying saying yes, let's talk WebSockets. It's agreeing to whatever version the client has picked out. So that's the summary of that's the summary of the what the handshake looks like, and so we're going to dig into why the different parts of it are in there. Um, so in particular, there's the that sec WebSocket key WebSocket accept those two headers. Um, so if those weren't there, then every time your uh, the browser like you refreshed the page and it started over and it opened a new WebSocket to the same server, these ex the this like these two the request and response would look exactly the same character for character. Uh, and so some helpful cache in the middle would say, "Hey, look, I bet you know they're making the same request. I bet they want the same response as last time." And the server would never even see your request. You would just get. A, this response, and then the socket would close because the cache is like, yep, I got it for you. I have no idea what you actually meant, but I'm pretty sure if I copy pasted it, it'll be what you want. Um, so instead, uh, the every time your browser makes a WebSocket connection, it picks a random number, a random 16-byte number, and it encodes it in base64, and that means the request always looks different. And then the server has to do a defined operation and end up with this other number that it sends back in its header, which means that both sides know that they're actually talking to each other. So the server has proved that it has actually read the client's uh, request and that it's actually seen the uh, number in that header. Um, so and so there, there's like just a defined uh, procedure for going from the key to the next header. OK. So. The at the top there is the client's key, and then we concatenate it with a string from the RFC. So that next line um, is just like a magic string from the RFC. You always use the same one, and then you take a SHA-1 hash, and you get some just some bytes there, and then you basically go forward and code the result, and that's what you stick in the server's uh, WebSocket accept header. So it's, the important part isn't what exactly you do. It, the important part is that you're doing something specific so that you're not just copy pasting the value from the request into the response. And so that means that you know, we're actually connected to the server. So now the negotiation part. Uh, so we are negotiating a version. So in this part, there's not much negotiation going on. And for most WebSockets currently, there shouldn't be any negotiation because there's only one valid version of WebSockets, version 13. All of the previous versions were draft versions that you're not actually supposed to use. I think Safari implements one, but every, nobody else is supposed, nobody's supposed to be using those if they're following the RFC. Um, but so what they did include in the RFC what would happen you know, when we get more versions, how you're supposed to negotiate. So I'm going to show you a more interesting example than just like it works. So the, this client is asking for version 25 of WebSockets. The server says, nope, bad request. I can't do that. And it includes a header that lists the versions it does accept so that the client can either, you can either think of it as continuing the handshake and, or you can think of it as starting over. It's just the server, uh, the client starts over and says, you know, same request, but this time it includes one of the versions the server accepts. OK, so now we've got our, we're talking WebSockets. We're speaking a specific version of WebSockets. Um, so now we can define subprotocols. So subprotocols are like an ex extension to WebSockets. You can only be using one at a time. Um, and they sort of redefine what the payload is going to be and how it's structured. So rather than just being a binary blob, it should con con like actually can be the subprotocol you've agreed on. So the 
client pick lists you know chat and super chat and it the it lists them from its most preferred to its least preferred and then the server picks one it could pick zero of them which means it just wouldn't put that header in so this is the version where the server just doesn't want to speak any of the offered protocols um and then so at this point we've completed our opening handshake and so now we're ready to send uh, messages back and forth um, and I'm about to show you the wire protocol for the messages. But first, uh, there's like two things you need to know before the, the we see the wire protocol. So first, we've been talking about messages. So the applications on either side see data appear as, an, as a complete message. But on the wire, they're actually sent as frames. So some messages will just be one frame, but some messages can be sent as multiple frames. And a frame is just the data plus a header. So you can break break them up over multiple frames, and then you just concatenate them back together to get the full message. Um, and the other thing is that the client masks its payloads, so it does an operation. The, internet, the browser does an operation on the data the JavaScript gives it and before it puts it into the frame. And on the other side, the server unmasks it before handing it to the application. Um, we'll talk about why that happens in a minute, but there's masking in the frame, so I want to make sure you're not surprised by that. So let's look at what, how a frame is actually structured. So a frame is basically just the headers plus a payload. So this is the ASCII diagram from the RFC. It's each column is one bit, and it's 32 bits wide. And so we read it uh, left to right, top to bottom. So the very first bit is this one called fin. And so this is basically the is this the last frame bit. If it's one, this is the last frame in a message. If it's zero, then we're not the last frame in the message. Um, we have three reserved bits. These are always supposed to be zero uh, since they're reserved for future use. And if we let them be undefined, then somebody's going to stick data in them. So they have to be zero. Then we have an opcode. That's four bits. So that's defining the different types of messages we can have. And we'll talk about what those are in a minute. You've already know that some of them are data messages, and at least one of them is the closed message. This bit says whether it's masked. So the client always has to set this to one and include the masking key, which is 32 bits. And then the server always sets it to zero and never includes the masking key. And if the other side does the wrong thing, or the client doesn't mask it, or the server does, then the side that receives the wrong data should close the connection and say, you didn't follow the protocol. So the next part is the payload length. So this is seven bits, which means you can, you can go zero to 127. And this is bytes, so that your frame could be up to 127 bytes. But actually, we think we'd want bigger frames than that. So you can extend it to, hold, to be 16 byte bits, or you can extend it to be a 64-bit integer, which is really, really big for a number of bytes in a frame. Uh, so this is sort of interesting how they have this set up. So if we wanted to go anywhere up to 125, then we just put the seven bits right there in the seven bit the place in the second byte. So this is how we would do the length for a 125-byte message. Uh, if we wanted to do 126, then we'd write it like this. We'd put 126, which is a reserved value in the seven bits, and it says that the next 16 bits will be the actual length. And then we put 126 in the actual bits. Um, 127 works the same way. Uh, but if you, 127 is, we, we put 126 in the seven bits because we want to use 16 bits to represent 127. Uh, if we wanted to do 64 bits to what represent 127, then we could put 127 twice. Uh, and there's lots of zeros here since 127 is much smaller than 64 bits. But so this is, you can get a really, really big frame if you wanted to, although I'd, you usually don't need anything that big. Okay, so we've covered the length, and then we, we already talked about the masking key that's just 32 bits that the client picks, just a random number. And then we have the payload data. So why are we using frames? Uh, and so part of this is uh, why, are we, fi why are frames different from just a message? So uh, having frames as a separate concept from messages means that we can do buffering. So while WebSockets is a message-based uh, protocol, you could put a streaming API on top of it. But then, you know, if you didn't have fragmentation, you'd have to wait for the, the application that's handing you data to give you the whole, whole data, and you have to cache all of it until you could send it, because you can't send it until you know how long it is, because the headers come before the data. Uh, 
So this way you can say, well, every time they hand me like one megabyte of data, I can send a frame out, and I'll just keep sending frames until they say they're done sending me data. Um, so why would we, well, so now you say maybe I'm creating a problem. I mean, I put the length first. I could make my protocol different and avoid that. Um, but then we'd have to use delimiters. And that means that we're letting them send arbitrary binary data. So then it's going to be funny. Any, any like sequence we pick is going to be in band, which means that then we'll have to escape it. And we're like creating a bunch of problems for ourselves, uh, just complexities of implementation. Like we have to figure out when the thing is done, and we have to find our delimiter and then unescape all of the other delimiters. And we also have to keep reading some section of uh, data in without knowing how much we're planning to read. So it's, it can be hard. It's, it creates lots of implementation stuff without having like big benefits over fragmentation. Um, and so why aren't we just a stream protocol so we don't have to delimit things into messages? And the reason that WebSockets is a message protocol is one, well, most modern libraries that people send data through choose to be message protocols anyway. Um, but also it that means that the user doesn't have to try to buffer their data. They can just send a message and not worry about splitting things up into or putting them back together later when it wants to send them over the stream. Um, so why are we masking data from the client? And why is it only the client and not the server? So first of all, masking just means that you're doing this operation. There's the masking key and the uh, masked data in the frame. And so to get the masked data, the client XORs the masking key, which is four bytes with the original data. And so you, you just go through and uh, XOR each byte, and you keep you know, repeating the with the same key. And then when the server wants to get the original data back, it just does the exact same operation, and it gets back the original data. So one thing you might notice is that this isn't keeping anything secret. Like, everything is right there in the frame. Anybody who wants to read the data can read it. We're not preventing that at all. Um, but it is actually still a security problem. Like, this is the reason we're, we would do this is for security. Um, and so we're preventing a cache poisoning attack. Um, and so what I'm going to show you here is, so if in a world where WebSockets did not require the client to mask the data, what would we do to uh, poison a cache? And so that means that somewhere out in the internet, there's a cache. And this helps the internet go faster by serving you static pages. Um, and s if you can convince the, that cache that you know, your malicious copy of some uh, internet resource is the correct copy, then anybody who requests it will get sent this malicious copy instead of the real one. Um, and so in order to make this happen, sorry, the, there's supposed to be an animation. Um, so these are supposed to appear at one at a time. So one, uh, first you're going to set up a WebSocket uh, to a server you control. So this means that you convince some victim to open your page, and it runs some JavaScript, and the JavaScript opens up the WebSocket uh, to your server. And then the client sends a WebSocket frame whose payload looks just like an HTTP request, like character for character, just a normal HTTP request for some popular resource that you would like to replace with your own copy. And so you send that over to your server. And it doesn't matter where it would normally be requested from, because it's definitely going to your server. You already opened the TCP socket. And the server responds with a WebSocket frame where the payload looks exactly like an HTTP response, um, which is the malicious one that you want, want to get into a cache. And then some very friendly HTTP cache in the middle says, you know what? I don't understand those, he those header bytes at the front, but this is definitely an HTTP request and response, so I'm going to cache them for the next person who requests these things. And so you pick something helpful, like you know, something popular like an ad or like you know, the, the JavaScript, whatever requests to like count page views. Um, and now you know, anybody who goes, who goes to an actual like, friendly site uh, and requests this resource, if they're behind the same cache as the victim, also get this whatever malicious thing you put in there. Um, and so this is basically another problem with over-eager caching. This is not actually just like a dreamed-up scenario. They like tested it and found that a non-zero percentage of like stuff in the internet actually ends up doing this for you if you don't mask the stuff from the client. And so the, the reason it's only the client is that they're just worried about a JavaScript page doing it. If you prevent the JavaScript side from being able to do it, then the server can't do it either because it can't manufacture the request. Um, and so we talked about that's why you mask, that's why the client masks the data. Um, it's also important to note the browser has to pick a secure form of randomness to pick the masking key so that the JavaScript won't be able to figure out what the next key is. So it won't be able to make data such that when it's XORed with the next key, it becomes the HTTP request again. 
Um, so let's talk about the different kinds of messages. So this is the opcode. Um, so an opcode, we, ha we have 16 different values, 0 to 15. So there's data frame opcodes. The currently used ones are 1 for text, 2 for binary. Uh, text has to be UTF-8. Binary is just an arbitrary binary blob. So if you don't you want to use UTF-8, you want to use a fancier kind of Unicode, just send a binary blob. And then 3 through 7 are reserved for future use. So all of these, uh, these are the lower ones. So they all start with 0 as their highest order bit. The control frames all start with 1. So 8 is the closed frame, 9 and, uh, and 10 are ping and pong. So I can send a ping frame, and then the other side has to respond with a pong frame. And then uh, the rest of the high highest ones are reserved for future use. And these are specifically reserved for control frames, and 3 or 7 are specifically for data frames. Um, 0, which I hadn't mentioned yet, is for fragmenting. And you're going to see how it works in a minute, because our next thing is going to talk about what does it actually look like when we fragment the messages into fr multiple frames? First, we're going to look at the single frame messages. So this is a single frame text message. So the first bit is 1, because it's the last frame in the message. And then we have our 0 reserved bits. And then we have our opcode is 1, which means text. And then we fill in the payload length. And then at the end, we have our payload data, which is just some text. Um, so this is an entire message. And then we can also send a control frame. So here is a ping frame. Uh, it's also the last. It, as with all, all control frames can never be fragmented. So they have to all look like this, where the fin bit is 1, because it's the only frame in the message. And then we have the opcode for ping. And they can have data, but they can, can't have more than 125 bytes of data. So you, can, you never use the extended length when you're doing a control frame. And for ping, if you put data in it, then the pong responding to it has to copy paste the data from the ping into the pong. So you can get some, you can know which ping they're uh, particularly responding to. So let's talk about multi frame messages. So this is going to be a data message, a text message, in, because you, know, you can't fragment uh, control frames or control messages. And so this is going to be for uh, the, while well, the client doesn't know that and the server doesn't necessarily know, I'm just going to tell you up front this is going to be a four frame message. So here is our first frame. The fin bit is 0 because we are not the last frame in the message. The opcode is 1 because we're a text message. And there we have some text at the bottom. Um, and then here is the second frame of the message. The, it still has 0 for the fin bit because we're not the last one. And the opcode has changed. It's now 0. All of the frames in the message that are not the first frame do not have, an op do not have a real opcode. They all have 0 because it has to be the same one. All of the following frames for the message have to still be text. Um, and from this, you also know that uh, WebSockets cannot multiplex messages. You have to send one message and then start the next one. Um, so we're sending more text here. And now we have a ping. This is not part of our data message. This is a fifth extra frame in the middle. That's because you can interleave control messages with data messages. So if the data message is fragmented, you can stick a control message in there at any time. One of the nice things is lets you do, if you were in the middle of sending a really big message, and then all of a sudden you have to close for some reason, you can send your close message, and it's fine. Like, it's a control message in the middle of a data message, so they should be able to handle it. So here's our ping, and then we keep sending, we continue with the data message we were already sending. So here's the third frame, still 0 for the fin bit, so we're not done yet, and still 0 for the opcode. And then we have our last frame. It has 1 because it's the last for the fin, because it's, it's the last frame, and 0 for the opcode. Um, and so in order to turn that series of frames back into a message for the application, we concatenate all of the payloads, and it becomes this. This is just the text from all of the frames we saw. So now we've sent our data back and forth. We sent some control frames back and forth, so we're ready for the closing handshake. So what happens is each, each side sends a close. So if the client wants to close, they send a closed frame to the server. And then when they get the server's closed frame, they know that they've received all of the data that the server sent them. Uh, this is as opposed to just closing the TCP socket, which means they don't know what the server was trying to tell them. They just closed it off without knowing. Um, another nice thing is you can send, you can both start your handshake at the same time, if because either side can close the connection. So if the client and server both decide at the same time it's time to close the connection, they both send close, and then later they both receive close, and they're both happy they completed their handshake. Um, and so close, like like ping and pong, close can also have a payload. A close, the, the, there's more a more defined payload for close. It has a two byte has to start with a two byte status code. 
Um, and then you have an optional message after that. You can put whatever you want in the message, but the status code is specifically defined. For example, the, the RFC defines about a dozen different uh, closed statuses. Some of them aren't errors, so like 1,000, the lowest one is just we're closing because you know, we did what we wanted to do with this WebSocket. Um, and then some of them, like protocol error, are like, you know, you did something wrong. Uh, and then so they, they also define sort of the closed status code ranges. So like there's, you know, a couple of thousand that are reserved for future RFCs, and then some of them that you can register and some of them that you can't register. Um, and so that's, you know, the closing handshake. And now I just want to draw back some points that we saw by seeing the design of the WebSockets protocol. So one thing they do pretty well is they make sure you've agreed on exactly what your format you're going to use. So WebSockets is a pretty extensible protocol. So we have to agree that we're using WebSockets, the version we're using, and what sub-protocol, if any, we're going to use. There's also extensions that are negotiated similar to a protocol. The difference is you can have more than one extension, but you only have one sub-protocol. Um, they also leave room for standards. So WebSockets is you know a standard, and then you can put other standards on top of it by having things like sub-protocols. Uh, they also leave room for growth in the protocol. So like they have those reserved opcodes, they have reserved status codes, they have reserved bits. Sticking that extendable length up to 64 bits is also sort of more room for growth and future proofing. Like if you know maybe someday we will think you know it'll be like when we said, well, 64 bits is enough length for anybody. Kind of like you used to say 64 megabytes is enough memory for anybody. Um, you can also, another thing they do pretty well is considering uh, non-endpoints. Like a lot of those security things we were looking at where you have to send the keys back and forth or you have to mask the client data is like preventing the insides of the internet that are not really part of your protocol and don't really understand what's going on from messing things up by uh, being too eager to help you cache things. Um, so thanks for listening. Most of my information is from the RFC and the implementing WebSockets for Julia. Uh, I have a question. Uh, is there any control of uh, if some message, some part of big message is lost? So it's over a TCP socket. So TCP is responsible for getting you all of the data in order and taking care of all the retransmitting and that stuff. So that's, what, that's one of the reasons why other protocols often are over TCP, like HTTP is, where you just you set, you give your data to the TCP socket and it's responsible for, figure, for getting the data there in order. OK, thank you. So what's your opinion about HTTP2 in terms of WebSockets? Do you think it will replace them? You're asking about replacing TCP? No, I mean that HTTP feature of pushing from the server to the client. Yeah. And what do you think about that in terms of WebSockets? I mean, so the main advantage of WebSockets is that is actually that you can go in the other direction faster. Like for the long pulling for keeping a connection open to the server means the server can push immediately, just like a WebSocket. But it means the client has to set up a new TCP connection and then send its request to push data. So you have a whole extra round trip time when you want to send data to the server. So that's one of the advantages of WebSockets. Um, I think something like SockJS is nice where it, for the brow it uh, is this layer over uh, browsers where you can use the SACJS interface, which is very much like WebSockets, and it'll use the browser-specific interfaces, whatever is actually available, and make it all look like WebSockets. And someday, if all browsers implement WebSockets, you can just switch over to them.